Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, or very good night, or very good morning for the West Coast, and uh, very good morning as well, you know, for Tahiti. And uh, Mr. Minister, if you're listening new to this session, we had a blast, you know, with your introduction in the car. So we hope next year you can do that in a chopper, you know, getting back, you know, to the island. Uh, saying that, we have, you know, one important panel. We want to discuss about uh, seaweed as food. And uh, we have uh, some uh, very top experts in the topic, you know, related to the topic. And it's going to be um, a challenge for me to try, you know, to to organize the discussion. Because last time in the prep call, it was impossible for me, you know, to, to get some, some, some rigidity, you know, in the organization. So I will try to do my best. And before we get, you know, introduce each of the panelists, I'm going to give the floor to David. And I want to make sure that you, you, you stay to your 10 minute introduction, David. <laughs> so you introduce yourself and you go ahead with your introduction. And then after, we'll go and uh, explain who is on the panel. The floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, greetings to everybody. I'm David Mislavotsky. I've been working and supporting Seaweed Industries for many, many, many years. I provide technical services. I'm located in Maine. So let's start, it's only 10 minutes. So greetings to everybody, wherever you are. I would like to thank the organizers, especially Pierre. This is a forum that this forum should and could be the trigger for the next phase in our industry. We have to grow. We absolutely have to grow this industry. And we are here to figure out how to do it. We know that seaweeds have been used for at least 14,000 years. They are not exclusively Chinese, Japanese. You have cultures that they are still using them. Far East Russia, Alaska, Hawaii, Chile, Irish, Scottish. So when we talk about seaweed, sea vegetables, uh, marine produce, we are not talking about Asia and eating with chopsticks. We are talking about very old traditions that they are all over the world. In some cases, we will need to reintroduce it. And with some people, it may be some new food items. Talking about food, I want to stress that seaweeds are safe. Seaweeds are not mushrooms. You don't have to worry that you go out to the beach and then you don't come back. As long as your seaweeds are harvested from clean waters, there is no risk because there is no such thing as a poison seaweed. Now, sorry, but I told you I need my guide. We have at least 12,000 different seaweed species. We only eat about 200. Large scale, we only harvest maybe 10. We are uh, harvesting around 35 million tons, but we want to grow this and we want to feed the people. So let's compare our 35 million ton with fresh veggies in China. They have 180 million tons. The world harvests 370 million tons of potatoes, 770 million tons of wheat, so we really have ways to go. There is a lot of room to bring more and more seaweed to the people as food. We don't want to do what some industrial uh, land-based agriculture has done, to have huge farms with one or two species. We want to increase the landings, but we also want to increase the diversity of the seaweeds that Gronovi served as food. Which segments in the, in the food market you find seaweeds? The closer to my heart is seaweed as food, seaweed as veggie, seaweed as a produce, seaweed as gastronomical experience. You don't worry about how much vitamin, how much minerals. You talk about the texture, the color, the way it crunches. You are talking about really a gastronomical experience uh, I would like to make one suggestion for the industry. We need 
for a lack of a better word, we need seaweed sommelier. We need people that they are trained and they can talk about the common language, what's the aroma, what's the texture, how do you prepare. When you go to a restaurant, the Maitre D doesn't give you 10 grams of protein and 7 milligrams of vitamin B12. The Maitre D is going to give you a gastronomical experience. We need to bring that into our industry of seaweeds as food. Think about seaweeds. They don't have to be on the plate. A lot of seaweeds, they can stay in the kitchen. You use seaweeds to prepare dashi. You use seaweeds to cure a lot of meats. There are a lot of products that the seaweed is part of it, but you don't have the big chunk of seaweed on the plate, but you are still enjoying the flavor and the characteristics of seaweeds. Uh, talking about seaweeds and food, we cannot forget, we have to mention the texturant industry. Hydrocolloids, whichever name you want to give to them, agar, alginate, and carrageenan, they are a huge and old part and a traditional part of the seaweed industry. They have done well with harvesting wild. They have done extremely good, Philippine and Indonesia, for farming, but they are part of the food industry. Another segment where we have seaweeds, seaweeds they have been used, not the seaweed, but extracts, extracts of seaweeds that have been used as functional ingredients. A very interesting uh, market now is that people are extracting proteins out of seaweed and they are engineering meat replacement foods. This uh, actually panel, I think she's one of the experts in that market segment, but wherever you hear alternative protein, alternative protein, you have the seaweed, seaweed, seaweed. So this is a good market segment to be in. It's not real food, but we are all familiar with seaweed products used as supplements, nutraceuticals, the kelp peels, uh, you put it through your mouth, it's not food, but it's nutrition. So we also have to be aware of that market segment. Now, what do we need to do? What uh, are going to be my suggestions? We need to produce more by a lot. We really have to grow farming, harvesting. We have to protect. We have to increase. We have to support the new farmers in the Western world. We have to be bolder in processing. Uh, excuse me, but selling dry seaweeds in a bag, a little bit of flakes in a bag. Yes, it's a good business, but I'm a processing person. It's a little boring. So we have to be much bolder. We should be able to develop hundreds or thousands of different products. If anybody can go to Japan or even today in China, they are developing new products. They can have multiple products out of the same uh, piece of uh, seaweed, and they have hundreds of different products on the shelves, and they are all coming from, from seaweeds. And yes, there are cultural differences. They are different cultural frameworks. We have to adapt to them. Some people would like to farm in huge amounts and we should support them because we cannot have an industry when people talk about and harvest so many pounds. You want to be a boutique farmer, that's fine, you are a specialty, but we need to start having farms in the Western world that they talk about thousands of metric tons. And in three or five years, I would like to see farms that they harvest in the 10,000s of metric tons. And we should be ready for supporting with processing. Now, one of the proposal is stop talking about seaweed and talk about sea vegetables. That's fine. I mean, I tried before, we can, we can try it again, but my proposal is we absolutely have to stop talking about seaweed singular. Seaweed has this, seaweed has that. We can't. Talk about wines, talk about cheese. If you are a good producer and you have quality, 
you should be rewarded by your specialty and you have to be able to put in the market you know this is my irish moss from this farm from this date and look at the tradition and you should be able to have a premium you can compare your average nori cheap nori that they put in the snacks you cannot compare that with the premium special reserve from the ariaki that it's a whole almost as good as sex i would claim that when you have that and you consume that type of a nori or karagu koi kelp i mean i could go for hours what can we learn from asia to bring into differentiate all the different types of seaweed farmers and seaweed harvesters so hopefully we are still some old timers we are willing to be part of the process but we absolutely have to grow this industry thank you you set up the floor very nicely and uh, i don't know if we're going to talk about you in the last part but eventually we're going to talk about interesting topics so let's go around you know the panel so first Jen, uh, you are the next generation. Uh, and so uh, tell us about you, your company, and uh, tell us about, you know, your global vision about seaweed. Sure. Yeah. I'm Jen Lamy. I'm the Senior Sustainable Seafood Initiative Manager at the Good Food Institute. So we are a global nonprofit organization working around the world to advance the alternative protein industry. Um, our theory of change is basically that consumers primarily choose their, their food items based on taste, price, and convenience. And um, we, as we want to shift folks away from animal proteins and towards a, a broader, more diverse set of proteins in their diet, um, we need to produce products that meet their needs um, on taste, price, and convenience. And so we work across policy, but also science and technology um, and corporate engagement to really help to, to pull all the pieces together and serve both as a think tank and, and a sort of a consultant and advocate um, for the industry. Um, we are a nonprofit organization, not a trade association, um, and are, are funded by philanthropy. Um, I My interest in this space really comes from the, the need for an increasing um, amount of seaweed ingredients from a wide range of species um, into the alternative protein industry broadly and definitely into alternative seafoods. So if we think about products that are, you know, analogs of um, the fish and shellfish that people love, but um, being able to produce them through different technology platforms, um, either plant-based or fermentation enabled or cultivated, um, grown directly from cells, then we, we can really start to think about how uh, seaweed uh, could be a part of that. So uh, if we think about, you know, fish eating seaweed and getting a lot of their nutritional and sensory profile from their own diet, um, we're sort of talking about adding products that that skip the middleman a little bit and, and remove the animal from the equation um, for greater efficiency and reliability of the market um, and, and also for nutrition in a lot of ways. So I think um, David made some great points about the functional properties um, from texture, but also some of the nutritional um, benefits from, you know, the omega-3 content and the protein content and micronutrients as well, um, that, you know, the alternative protein industry really as a whole will, will benefit from incorporating these ingredients as much as possible and, and can really benefit the uh, organic seaweed industry by creating a really robust and, and growing market for those products. Thank you, Jen. Very nice introduction. Now we move to... Uh... Fiona. Uh, Fiona is this type of seaweed connoisseur uh, that can, that is very knowledgeable. She can talk about seaweed during hours. She cooks seaweed, she drinks seaweed, she adds seaweed, you know, to the whiskey. She had, you know, seaweed in the, in the cooking. Seaweed is all over. I tasted, you know, the pancakes, I tasted, you know, everything. And uh, she is marvelous. And, and so Fiona, can you say one introduction what what you're doing what is mara and what is your global vision about seaweed thanks pierre thanks for the for the introduction and uh, greetings everyone from scotland um yes that pierre has come and visited me in scotland uh, and seen our company and uh, has tried many different products and many different ways of eating seaweed and there's probably nothing well i challenge a challenge to know if there's anything we haven't thought about so um 
we're based in Scotland and uh, I set up this company um, I've set up this company 10 years ago starting really from a, from a place of really being excited about the different tastes of seaweed so um, we we started from a from very much from a, a food angle and over the years we've just seen in this massive we've we've developed a vertically integrated um, seaweed business where we've built a brand that's now on the supermarket shelves in the UK supermarkets and we've been shipping over uh, selling products in the States for several years now so we are um, we've developed a, a food brand but we also are at the other end of the supply chain we farm and we process all our own products so we have got a really deep knowledge on all aspects of seaweed for food including the um, opportunities and the barriers to getting seaweed into the supply chain so whereas um, as I agree with David we you know we've developed for instance this we're talking about taste this is smoked dolls it's got three great taste stars it's an amazing product so you've got all of these things you could do with all the different types of seaweed and we specialize in a number of different species and where we started from was seaweeds that we knew had a tradition of being used in traditional culture in Scotland and Ireland and Wales in the British Isles really so that's where we started from so um, we now have a vertically integrated processing facility and we're developing all sorts of products and we want to develop more and more and more um, so and so as far as the potential for food you've got it, it is extraordinary i could go on for hours but obviously like jen you have the massive increase in interest in alternative protein what we've seen in the consumer end of the market in europe especially in in the uk massive growth of plant-based eating it's really gone ballistic and there's just massive interest in plant-based eating and seaweed absolutely plays a part in that um, you've also got the nutritional aspects of seaweed with the micronutrients there's a massive increase in uh, interest in alternative healthy salts which is where products where we are there's an interest in the micronutrients of seaweed in the west and in in um in other countries like in the indian ocean in africa what you, where you have malnutrition you have a massive massive potential for really transforming um, lives with with the micronutrients and protein that seaweed can can be part of that that process and products in those markets. So I will stop there and um, let let uh, Munir des describe his his company <laughs> and look forward to the discussion. No 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 no. Um, I had some technical issues, so that's why you know I was checking on the other side. So the last panelist is all over your plate. Uh, you don't know yet, but CELT Marine Group is like your computer. You have a computer and sometimes you remember the name of your computer, but the chip that is inside your computer, you never know, but it's called Intel. And I call CELT the Intel from the seaweed. Everything you eat, you have some CELT seaweed inside. And this is you know, the best introduction I can do for Munir. But Munir, please, you know, tell us who you are, what you've done so far as the largest organic seaweed producer in the world. Uh, can you tell us more about your vision? It's going to be much better if you unmute. Yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah. It's OK. Hello, everyone from Tunisia. Uh, thanks, Fiona. Uh, thank Pierre for this uh, introduction. Um, and um, yeah, uh, uh, the project of CELT uh, is, is created uh, 26 years ago um, in Tunisia uh, to, 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 to do seaweed farming first and processing seaweeds. Uh, we work on the, on the, at the beginning on the red seaweeds, but all type of red seaweeds. But the idea of the project at the beginning is to create, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, David talk about that, uh, Jen also, Fiona, is to supply new food and new superfood. We talk about superfood, okay? And this superfood definitively today bring you, can bring you protein, 
can bring you the, the best macronutrients, but also the new bio compound that they can give you also, uh, you know, the good reaction against the virus. And, uh, and, and 26 years ago, I have this idea, but uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, um, it, it will be at this, at this time uh, impossible. And today, uh, with the product of CELT, but not only CELT, but the product that they come from seaweed farming, uh, from the red, uh, from the green, from the brown, we see that the biocompound inside can help and can prevent many diseases. We know, like, like David tell, that uh, Japanese and Chinese know by traditional eat seaweed to prevent. I, I give you a, a joke. 15 years ago, I go to Malaysia with a Chinese guy. I am in a restaurant with him. And at this table, there is 10 people. And they, you know, it's 29 degrees. And they, they begin by the soup. And in the soup, there is a, there is a seaweed. And, uh, you know, at the beginning, I, it's too hot. It's impossible to, for me to eat uh, soup at the beginning. And I tell, why you eat soup? Because he tell me, if I don't eat soup, this guy is 65 years uh, old. He tell me, if I don't, uh, uh, I, I, eat, I don't eat soup, I have your skin. And at this moment, it's not good skin, you know, that I have, you know. <laughs> and, but what he tells me through, through the joke is definitively uh, seaweed can prevent, but can help you, your body, uh, uh, for the skin inside your body. And uh, definitively today we know that you can prevent a virus, you can, uh, you can help your body to, to fight uh, all the type of bacteriological uh, and, and, and virus uh, disease. And that, uh, to resume about what is the idea of CELT, is seaweed farming for catching CO2, processing seaweed, like uh, David tell, for texturing agent, that is our old uh, uh, production, but to tomorrow and today is uh, manufacturing uh, bio compound uh, to see different alternatives for food, like superfood for, uh, uh, for the people and to prevent disease for the future by the food and not by the medicine. That is the idea. Yeah, for this nice introduction. Just for the, for the people trying to record, there's no need for recording uh, what you see at the top of the screen. There's no need for recording the session. It will be published on the Biomarine website afterwards. Try to concentrate on the exchange. So my question, um, the next one is, uh, and I don't know who will answer this one, but most probably David. Um, in the recent month, some contradictory message have been spread about, you know, uh, the, the, the importance of seaweed, the heavy metals, the pollution. So what do we say to the consumer? Is it safe? Is it good, you know, generally speaking, to eat seaweed and cement? David, you want to be the first one to answer? You on mute. Okay, now now I'm good. Yes, there is. It's a little bit upsetting. Contra the, the worst thing that you can do is put contradicting ideas, like you know, a Facebook group. You don't go to Facebook. Go to the facts. Go to the knowledge. Go to the tradition. See see what we are. My position is: How many people have died from eating seaweed? We found records of 14 people around all the history and mainly indirectly connected to seaweed. Seaweeds are not poisonous. Seaweeds are not toxic. But food first has to be safe. Then it has to be tasty. Uh, we have issu issues, a perceived issue about iodine. Think the balance about all the children, pregnant women, toddlers, that you guarantee that they have good iodine versus one or two people that may have an issue. We are talking corona vaccines. If one or two people have a bad reaction, the whole population is going to be protected. So if you protect the whole population, as Munir said, there are a lot of bioactives that you have, nutrients, whatever you want to call them, you feed them seaweed, you are guaranteeing a better health in the general population. So iodine, yes, there are very few that they are too high that we need to control. 
and we have to trust each of us, the regulatory agency, to be sure that in the market there is nothing that it's not healthy. Uh, some reports about arsenic. The Japanese people have been eating hijiki for ages. I don't see the Japanese people dropping like flies. That's a point that has to be investigated because for some reason they develop, uh, they can eat tons of hijiki and nothing happens to them. Do we want people consuming a lot of inorganic arsenic? No, you stay away from hijiki, you still have another 11,900 seaweeds to eat. Heavy metals, like any food, there are regulations. Uh, France, I think it went a little bit overboard with the new regulation. Yeah, so you are aware of it. So yeah, it has to be healthy but it has to be a sensible regulation. And my understanding is that the new guideline is long-term weekly exposure. So if you eat once a month, I mean, we can get into, as I said, let's not get into the weeds with the seaweeds, but the bottom line is how many people have issues consuming seaweeds versus the balance of the general population having a much, much better health. Uh, is it the trend that you see, Jen, you know, in the Good Food Institute, do you see that people have concern eating seaweed or what are the tendencies? I haven't done any research directly on seaweed, but um, we have not heard concerns about eating products that contain seaweed as ingredients. Um, so I think, I think it, probably depends on, you know, the product form, if people are, you know, seeing it, or if it's, you know, processed into a product, um, what the levels of concerns might be. Um, we, we definitely see that, you know, consumers also will, will say one thing and maybe uh, act another way in the way that they make their purchases. So some concerns don't always, you know, make their way to the way that people shop. Um, so for example, you know, there are in some parts of the world concerns about soy consumption, although there um, are, you know, not a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of research showing that soy is dangerous, but the, the you know, vast majority of very popular um, plant-based products do contain soy. So um, I think there's there's still room to, to find consumers that are comfortable with different products um, and to continue making sure that regulatory agencies are, are being honest about what is, um, what there are concerns with and what there aren't. And Muni, on your side, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the industry, do you see any reluctance you know, to use your seaweed because the consumer may have you know, some hesitation? Yes, well, D D David knows that, uh, you know, from a long time, there is a focus on the Karaganan linking to, <laughs> to, to, to one guy. But, but, but fr from some industry, there is, uh, in US, there is some problem about that. But in general, no. In general, they, 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 they love, the, they love the, 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 the project of the seaweed, the, the the, the texturing that they come from the seaweed, the, the protein alternative, because we talk now about plant-based uh, meat, and we talk now about what we talk about, uh, like Fiona, like, uh, like David talked. The idea now is to introduce seaweed, you know, in um, every day in the people. Because definitively, I, I trust, uh, and I believe that uh, seaweeds every day, you know, I, I take in my breakfast seaweed every day, and I can tell you from now, 10 years. Now, I um, help my body a lot. I farm intestinal, skin. Uh, it's incredible, you know, and we talk about wakame, we talk about ulva, you know, that is incredible. The idea now is to integrate in the industry. That, that is the idea, because if we talk about seaweed, like David talked, in the kitchen is not enough. We have to integrate in, in the industry by the alternative uh, uh, in the uh, protein meat. And that is the, uh, today we have to do that. And uh, the idea for the processing seaweeds today, you can do processing seaweeds, you can take protein at the beginning, and after you finish your process, you can take a uh, uh, texturing agent with the same product. That's why you can, tomorrow and today we, 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 we work on that, you can extract protein by 20 until 30% of the protein in your red seaweeds. And also you can do your texturing agent. 
and that you can you can do for the processing people uh, by today double revenue and help also to decrease the price of protein uh, uh, that they come from seaweed in the industry and bringing um, protein alternative of the meat uh, in the industry processing that is the idea I will come back to the to the topic just after this one. But Fiona, uh, when you knocked at the door of Tesco with your seaweed flakes, uh, and at that time you didn't have all the recipes that you, you have so far, so what was the first reaction? And how did you convince them you know, to get the product on the shelf? Um, well, two ways we went in. Um, the, the retailers are very aware of trends in in food and they know that seaweed is is you know a trend that's not going to to go away um so there was two ways we got in one was actually working with the development chefs in tesco and we went and did a day with the development chefs to show them all the different ways you could use seaweed because one of the biggest barriers for the consumer is really and for the chefs is really familiarity so you can break the barrier of actually this is not only tastes really good, it's really good for you and it's really easy to use. That is a major thing. But the, the one, the, the, um, the Tesco uh, buyers were interested in the healthy aspect, healthy seasoning and a, a natural alternative to salt for that particular product range that we've got on the shelf. It's in the herbs and spices aisle and, and it is, you know, there's a massive push within the British market to to make people healthy by reducing their salt consumption and seaweed can be seen as a way of seasoning your food by adding healthy salts and reducing the amount of sodium you put in so that was a major driver but they also know we also went in talking to retailers as seaweed as a category solution this is not just about being in the herbs and spices this is about being across every single part of the supermarket whether it's in the seafood aisle or in the Asian Isle, or in the, the you know, all sorts of different places that we can be in the plant paste. Um, so we see where we are now as the first step towards a, a massive increase in, sea, in our seaweed products throughout with the consumer. And, we, and as you bring in more and more products that the consumer understands, like seaweed burgers are you know another product we have is seaweed butter that is very very popular because it's so easy to understand because you can use it as an accompaniment to your regular seafood and it's not very difficult to 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 under to um to use so those are all the sort of the ways that the consumer can get into using seaweed on a daily basis like Monir, uh, before i jump to the others what will it take, you know, to take, you know, the plant base and switch it to the sea plant base? You have developed this seaweed burger. Uh, Fiona is working on seaweed burger. How will you convince, you know, the large industry players that seaweed should be all over the plates? What should we do? And I'm going to ask you all, you know, the question. I'd like, you know, to get some, some traction on this and some ideas. Um, what, what we see after the, 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 the COVID, that definitely a part, a part of the population now would like to prevent uh, disease. Would like to, because all of them now, everyone know that we have to boost our immunity. Now the children, adults, all people want to boost their immunity. And seaweeds can help you for boosting immunity. If, you, if we begin by that and 20% of the population could change, could change, only that, they could make a big revolution definitively in the industry processing. And our work in the, in the self marine, but also in the processing, all processing people, is to bring the texture has to be close about what the people know in their mouth. And that is our work, our job. And like Fiona do, we work on that. We have developed a solution on that. And this solution has to be the closest that the people know before in their tradition, in Europe, in US. And that is the idea. When you have definitively, after the, the COVID situation, uh, prevent uh, a disease 
boosting your immunity and also you give the same texture, definitely people go there, uh, go to this way. And that is our, our work that we work every day to, to finalize this, this target. And we are in the good way. Definitely we are in, we are in the good way. So, Jen, you, you really think that if we invent, you know, the fish, sea plant-based future product, there will be, uh, you know, consumer acceptance on this? I think the, the common thread that has been coming up a couple of times now is this familiarity cons to consumers. So if the products really allow them to, you know, have exactly what they want in terms of that, you know, that perfect texture and mouthfeel and aroma and have it cook the same way and, and smell and look the same way, um, then I absolutely think so. There's there's no other reason why not. Um, I think the, the sort of complement to that is also bringing price down, um, which, you know, comes with scale to an extent, but something that, you know, we hear from plant-based seafood producers and from people across the alternative protein um, industry is just that these ingredients are still very expensive for them. And, and they know that for their products to succeed, they have to come um, close to or below the price of their, their conventional counterparts. So being able to, you know, achieve those innovations, but also then scale that to, to a point where um, the ingredients can be provided to companies at a price that works um, within their, their operations is super important. I think that you will strongly disagree with that because you wish people to eat seaweed, not ersatz of seaweed, like, you know, uh, these guys in fish protein. So what do you say about this? Uh, I see, I mean, there is, there is enough space and there is enough market for everybody. You can have the protein extracted I used as an ingredient in analogs. That's okay. That's not my main uh, push, but thanks God we have Jen that she's pushing for that one. What I have seen is, like Fiona said, put it everywhere in the market. And I have seen, and hey, I am in a small town in Rockland and I don't claim I can cover all the markets, but I have seen shakers and flakes and spices and snacks. I mean, up to here with, with sea snacks. That's okay. But why instead of having the, and I would say in general, low quality Korean seaweed salad in the grab and go case, why don't we have local seaweed produce grab and go trays? I mean, People in the Philippines are doing, people in Japan, they are doing it. You can have sea grapes, you can have, we did it in Israel. We were selling freshly salted as part of the seafood case. So I would be happier as another option of having sea veggies as a grab and go tray in the supermarkets. So th that's one option. But that means- The other- Sorry. Let me just finish. The other one that we can do is, and Fiona, I think you are working on it. You put the seaweed as a nutrient enhancer. You put it in tortillas, in pitas, in cereals, in pastas. Uh, you can have it with or without flavor. That's part of your process. But we have a lot of segments where we can put it as food. To me, a snack, we shouldn't be teaching the children to snack all their life. A snack is like a quickie just because I'm hungry, but maybe I'm naive, but I should, I would like to see goes back to eating on the table with the family. It's healthy, it's more than the food, it's a social experience. I'm having seaweeds either snuck into a product or totally front end on a plate. We have a lot of opportunities calibrated to the local culture, of course, but the market is huge. The market is huge. What's, what's wrong with, with, what can people tell that is wrong with seaweeds? No, Not agree. ranting, but facts. What's wrong about seaweeds? I agree, but we need more integrated, vertical, integra vertically yes. integrated, you know, uh, yes. development and regional production. And that leads me you know, to the question that I want you know, to ask to Fiona. So uh, how do you see, you know, the, the local market and the regional market reacting to what you're doing? 
And did you get, you know, uh, a support from the authority? Did you get you know, support from the industry about what you've been developing? Because you 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 were struggling, you know, convincing people at, at the time. It was, of course, the COVID crisis. But how do you manage that? Because I totally agree. We should have more seaweed all over. We should develop, you know, vertically, locally. But what does it take? It, well, I mean, it takes finance to scale up scale up production and scale up marketing. I mean, yeah, I would love to be putting seaweed salads on the shelves of, on everyone's plate, uh, but you need finance to scale up to a scale where you can put processing in, where you can put a marketing budget together, where you have, you know, it's it all requires investment. And um, we have, we do have quite a supportive environment in the UK and the Scottish government have really got behind suddenly uh starting to get behind seaweed because they're, they're suddenly realizing that you know to meet um climate targets and cop 20 hosting cop 26 has suddenly focused the attention in glasgow this year on seaweed as you know something that is really can help meet some of these targets not just on climate change but also on looking at sustainable food life below the ocean all of these goals and so you need a supportive government, you need a good regulatory framework. Um, the Crown State in Scotland is very supportive of seaweed farming in general. You need, you know, food regulators that are helping you to grow and not putting barriers in your place, which at the moment in the UK, they're, they're supportive. And then the third thing we need is, is private, well, public money to help us get started, but also private money being put in, not just in seaweed in the water, but in the food side of things. And it's just as important as seaweed farming is what you do when you get the seaweed out of the water, because that put it, growing it is only half of, half of the chain. And what we have invested quite a lot of time in on a shoestring budget is really understanding every aspect of the supply chain through from the sea through to the plate and all of the technical requirements you need and how you explain that to a I mean we have a specialist uh, we also are a specialist ingredient company so we work quite a lot with manufacturers and I've got our, our products in other people's products and some of the stuff that we do is explaining to to other food companies about seaweed and how you use it and how you can use it to scale up but in order to scale up ourselves with our own brand and with our ingredients brand you have to put the money not just in the seaweed farming, but in everything that comes after that as well. And, and uh, Jen, um, from a regulatory point of view, uh, that the tendency, and we had the occasion during the different session to talk about regulation, about aquaculture, concession, developing. So what would be needed in terms of consumer protection, but also, you know, to ease the development of the seaweed industry. Do you have any idea uh, what is uh, currently being established or what will be in the future and uh, what are the expectations? I can let the, um, the folks closer to seaweed production speak about um, sort of the, the regulatory hurdles there more directly, but um, from a broader point of view, you know, one thing that um, comes up time and again in the alternative protein space is labeling and, and how to accurately and clearly and fairly label different production processes for um, products that look very similar. Um, so I think it's really important that we find a really clear way to communicate to consumers what the what the products are and what they're intended to replicate in terms of the kind of experience and how they're cooked. And, and in the case of cultivated seafood and, and cultivated meat more broadly, where you're you know growing genuine animal meat from cells um, to make it clear what the, um, the allergenicity risks are. Um, so all of that kind of labeling needs to be very accurate. And I think that extends to you know, products made from uh, seaweed ingredients where we can certainly lower some of the, the hurdles to production and, and processing. And then we still need the, the end product to be really clear um, in terms of you know, what it contains and, and what it's aiming to, to replicate. So I think I think that's a, a regulatory barrier in some cases that um, could arise and and should be avoided in in a lot of ways. We'll come to you, uh, David. But just Muni uh, to react on that point. Do you have the same bottlenecks and the same hurdle with the industry, or 
uh, are the expectations slightly different? No, actually, the, uh, about the regulatory in uh, in the, in the texturing, there is a um, uh, long experience for that. That's why we don't have the steel we see now in the market. You know, um, we we go because you know the e numbers in Europe is uh, is uh, definitely is a problem. You know because you you don't have e numbers for gelatin, but you have e numbers for agar agar and carrageenan that they come from seaweed and the people is afraid by the E406 or E407, but is not afraid by gelatin, you know? And uh, the, the regulatory don't help us for that, you know? It's uh, it's incredible, but it's linking to that. And due to the situation, people think E406 like uh, like a colorant, like a coloring agent, you know? Uh, they are afraid like that. And it's incredible that the, the food regulatory don't uh, explain more or don't make difference for that and that it could be a problem for the processing seaweed for the future uh, linking to that that's why we have to adapt and we have also maybe to do um, uh, make a product that they come from a native native texturing agent we come in this way okay that's why you have to present not carrageenan but native processing seaweed you know um, but but w definitively we have to work with the food regulatory to go to this way but also to see and to show the difference and the advantage that we have uh, compared to, to to the other product like gelatin you know and um, and um, and and for that we have to market uh, the product from seaweed everywhere to react about what Jen was saying yes one of the issues, uh, labeling, traceability, what are we talking about as ingredients or as a, a veggie? Are we okay with people putting seaweed as an ingredient? You cannot put fruit. You cannot put pieces of an animal. So it's kind of with Munir that you have to put the 407 or 402 or whatever, but then people put seaweed. Which one? So uh, we should get ahead and get together in the industry and create a common language for traceability, for ID, for pride. I want to be the person helping a farmer from Copscoff Bay be the proud supplier of a Unilever. So have the traceability, have the pride in your product, but it's not the same to have Irish moss or sea grapes or, or kelp. Mm -hmm. So creating a common language that we can identify which species of seaweed was used, where it was harvested, how it's going to be incorporated into the labeling, and which ones are allowed. Uh, I'm not too happy with the list in Europe where they deny ancient seaweeds that they had been used for hundreds or thousands of years, but nobody has the like the recipe from my great great grandpa from 1652 that they serve the king. Uh, and is laughing because you have been there that you serve him a bland manch. So let, let, let's be sensible. There is a risk. There is a risk analysis. Everything has to be healthy. Food has to be first healthy and then tasty. But we should, as an industry, get ahead of the game. Um, Munir, you, you are aware of Marinal. It's a very nice gang. Sometimes I call them the, 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 the Pudding Boys Mafia with love. But <laughs> they are a brother and they are a guild that they fight for their industry. So we should have the international guild of sea veggies if you want but we should have to put a group all our efforts the knowledge that we already have and promote and defend the industry to me that that that's something that we have to do starting yesterday because in order to grow the market by hundreds by thousand by ten thousand times we have to deal with putting food on the supermarkets, on the table, on the baskets, and there is regulation. So we are not afraid of the regulation. We better go and proactively deal with the regulation and have it ready so we don't have a barrier when the product is going to be launched. 
uh, I hear that message very, very clearly. And uh, with all the people that uh, we had online during the day, I'm pretty sure we can set up, you know, an expert group that will really bring some interesting uh, recommendation to use, you know, seaweed uh, with specific names, with specific origin, and to get a clear label on what we use, what we eat, and what we could, you know, buy from that. Uh, getting to the next point, uh, because this is very important as well. So, uh, I understand that we need to scale up. I understand that we need to go to the next level of production to be able to compete with plant-based, you know, uh, food and to provide, you know, the right protein for different markets. Uh, what are the next steps that we need to accomplish and what is required if we want to grow this industry in a very dramatic way? And uh, what, what type of investment are we talking about? Uh, Munia, you want to go first? Um, you know, um, we, we have a big tradition of uh, agricultural inland. We have to be, uh, and we have to create many seaweed farmers all around the world. That is our the first target. Definitely, I, I, I don't trust, I don't believe that uh, we have to take the wild. We, we take the wild, but it's not enough. We have to cultivate seaweed. That's yeah. the first idea. And now I work on that. That's why we have three seaweed farming. We are in Africa because we, we are in Africa. But uh, the other are in, in Asia. The other is in Europe, like, uh, like Fiona. And, uh, and we have to create many, many farmers. Farmers could be one hectare, you know. Farmers could be 150 hectare. But for that, we have to work with the government that definitively they have to open the license, the concession uh, to all the new uh, people that they enter in the market, that they would like to, to enter like agricultural, but uh, to, to help them to create their, their facility and their company, um, the small, the medium and the big one for the seaweed farming. And thanks to that, step by step, after that, they create because the model for extracting protein uh, you know, today it's complicated. In 10 years, it's nothing. And after, you can create locally in Africa, because we talk in Africa, but the same in Europe, you can take locally protein, uh, um, uh, vegan, uh, for the market with the local industry to create this, this plant base. And thanks to that, you develop the market, you know. Um, but we have to begin by, by the first step is seaweed farming and create many, many, many uh, um, uh, seaweed farmer all around the world. That is the, the, the first target for me. Trans sector and industry uh, point of view, uh, Jen, would you say that uh, what Monia's vision is correct or do we need maybe to adapt more to, to the need of the consumer and try to differentiate the industry and, and maybe invent a new model? What, what, what do you want to say about this? Yeah, no, I definitely agree that we do need to be cultivating more, um, but I think we can kind of do two things in parallel and do that at the same time as kind of building the the market because, you know, someone isn't going to jump into a market and start farming something without knowing that there's a really robust and, and growing industry for them to be supplying to. Um, so I think that means, you know, everything from figuring out what consumers want in different regions, whether it is, you know, a local seaweed salad or a burger with um, with a, a seaweed species in it, um, and, and figuring that out to then kind of specify where innovation needs to be in different regions. Um, I think that a, a really good concrete um, step in this industry that should be taken by governments on, you know, a national level, on a, on a more regional level, and then probably also on, you know, a multilateral international level is supporting um, research into figuring out sort of cultivation and processing of, of many different species because like David said, we're you know using such a small portion of, of the species that exist on earth um, and we could probably find some some really cool functional benefits of, of things that aren't currently commonly consumed. And I think getting more of that foundational research done and open access will allow you know, folks to figure out the right processing techniques for different end, um, end results and also different cultivation techniques to then be supplying those processors. So I think a lot needs to be happening at the same time in order for everyone to feel like there is um, you know, somewhere for, for their products to end up going.
Will you join your other team on this uh, on this question? I I've, I agree with with both of Jen and Munir. I think what we need is you know both both uh, ends of the scale. To we need a huge scale up. We need uh, support for seaweed entrepreneurs around the world. We want seaweed farms not just for brown seaweeds but for red seaweeds too. We, but we also need to look at the market side of the business. Uh, we need to do more on um, product development, research into products, research into new products, what we can do with all of the seaweed, get really creative, get out there, tell the world about the amazing things that you can do with seaweed, create products. And I think people are starting to and will get really excited about seaweed, not just because of the taste and the, and the nutrient profile, but consumers are making choices based on the environment now, which they didn't do on a scale that they are now doing. They're making choices and they will make choices to buy seaweed product because they know that's good for the planet. And I think that's a huge opportunity for people involved in, for seaweed for food because it 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 can be good for the planet so we need you know we've we've got a massive opportunity here and and for the industry and for the for to help the world and to grow this industry massively and i think it's really really exciting future so my last question and think about what you're going to say because it's it's on the tape um <laughs> What are you going to achieve before the next edition of Seaweed Around the Clock? Tell me, what is your commitment? And we're going to start with David. Yeah, my commitment is it's more of the same. I supply technical services to people that they use seaweeds. And I, I don't... Put it this way, I don't think the agar or carrageenan or alginates, they need my services. I mean, they are large enough, they are big enough, they are doing good. Look at look at what happened in, in Indonesia, 10 times the capacity in 10 years. But there is the need, and that's what I want to do, to provide technical services and help with the processing for whoever is harvesting wild or farmed and help them put hundreds of different products on the shelf the, that's what could, i have been doing david you could be french this is called a réponse de gascon you could be politician no this is not what i'm expecting from you <laughs> what is your commitment for next year what you really want to achieve be specific but what, what i'm doing is i cannot tell you the contracts that i have signed Sorry for that one. I'm not asking. But, I'm not asking. Uh, I'm not, what kind of great achievement for the seaweed industry, for the seaweed community, you want to achieve? We talk about you know, this expert group. I'm, I'm what going to be helping. I'm going to be helping seaweed farmers process their 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 seaweeds and bring products into the market. Very specific. Okay. I cannot tell you which country where, but this is to me. A change because I have been supporting much more the wild harvesters. I'm going to do a shift and start supporting also the, the farmers. But the key, as Fiona said, if you have the most beautiful seaweed in your farm, that's not a product, that's a hobby. Yeah. That product has to be transformed, has to be packaged, has to be labeled, and has to be put in a supermarket. And that's what I'm going to be doing. Excellent. So, Jen, next year, what can we expect from the Good Food Institute? A full report on seaweed tendencies? What is your commitment for next year? Something that we've just started work on is um, sizing the market for um, ingredients that give alternative protein products omega-3 pro uh, portfolios, which will be you know, essential to sort of building the, the business case for folks to get into producing seaweed. So we think that that will be able to encourage processors to, to get into the space, which will in turn um, you know, convince the, the harvesters and the farmers to um, you know, start supplying those processors. So I think that's probably the, the most concrete thing that I can offer at this time. Very good. Fiona, what is your commitment for next year, seaweed around the clock? 
what you want to choose. Okay, so Vara, by this time next year, we'll have scaled up our business. We'll have brought new products to the shelves, including that seaweed burger, Pierre, that you've already tasted. Uh, and we will have put our seaweed, scaled up our seaweed farming. And we'll have put new processing in so we can create more products to the market to fulfill, start fulfilling our vision to get everybody eating seaweed on a daily basis to improve the improve their health and improve and help the planet so our first step is more products scale up uh, and uh, so we can we can expand and and remember that on that side you need to talk with Munir because there are some very good synergies I can't disclose anything because I'm also you know, supporting Munir on his development and so the last question for you Munir can you summarize what you will have achieved by next year? You're on mute. Is it confidential? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> definitely, definitely. You know, we are in the seaweed on the clock. That's why I focus on law for the, for, for the seaweed. But definitely is to create a new seaweed farming in Indian Ocean. And you know Pierre well. Uh, that is the main focus for us. Um, uh, we finalize a new facility in Tunisia um, that is, uh, you know, it's uh, the, the dream of my life that I have. Uh, I'm in front of, I invite all of you uh, to, to come in November. Uh, we are in the, in the front of the sea, in front of the Laguna of Tunisia in the north of Tunisia, where we are 80 hectares, we produce uh, Gracilia verrucosa to produce agar agar, uh, and it's organic. Um, and, and I hope to finalize this plant in, in, uh, in the November and uh, create a new seaweed farming. And for the application, I have 100 in my head. That's why I, I, I keep in my head. Excellent. Thank you, guys. I think that we have a, a great potential with this, uh, this spirit, this vision. I think that uh, we are full speed ahead. And uh, I thank you so much for this uh, inspiring session. Uh, I invite everybody who is listening to get more seaweed into this plate or a plate. And uh, if you have any question, we'd be happy you know, to connect you with the panelists. Uh, don't be shy. And there's a great opportunity you know, for seaweed uh, you know, in the in the food, day-to-day -day food. And uh, I hope that next year, when we come back for the seaweed around the clock, there will be plenty of interesting you know, developments around the seaweed. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to close the session right now. Uh, the next session is starting at 7.45 sharp. And uh, we're going to talk about the social economic aspect of seaweed development. And I invite you to tune in. Thank you so much.